All right, guys, we are going to pick up where we left off yesterday with the decade of assassinations and then move on to the Great Society with a little bit of Johnson. And we should be right on track to start with the Warren Court tomorrow. Don't forget that your assignments that are due tomorrow are the journal, your Unit 11 documents at 2, and the feminine mystique and ERA questions that we should be answering in complete sentences. Okay, let's pick back up with Malcolm X uh, in our decade of assassinations here. We talked a little bit about Malcolm X in regard to the uh, civil rights movement and how he was kind of the opposite in his approach to how uh, civil rights were to be achieved, um, the opposite of, of Martin Luther King Jr. To give a little background, um, Malcolm X is going to find himself in uh, the care of uh, foster care after his father was killed um, by KKK members early on when he was young. Uh, he will drop out of high school uh, and he's going to move to Boston where he becomes involved in some criminal activity. When he turns 21, he's going to go to prison on a burglary conviction and this is where he finds himself being pulled into the teachings of Elijah Muhammad in the Nation of Islam. Uh, in this, when he comes out of prison, he is going to change his last name to X to symbolize the stolen African identity of those that were forced into slavery here into the United States. Um, once he gets out of prison as well, a few years later, he's going to start becoming um, a leader in the civil rights movement using his skills as a speaker. Um, he became an effective minister of the Nation of Islam, and he's really going to become a public figure speaking out uh, for the civil rights movement. And that's where he spreads his philosophy of we... Uh, we have to fight with what we can. Um, Nonviolent resistance isn't going to get us uh, where we need to be. Um, you, you have to protect yourself, essentially. Um, in the 1960s, he kind of crosses a few lines. When JFK is assassinated, he's going to make a comment saying, chicken's coming home to roost. Um, kind of saying like Kennedy deserved it. And with that, um, he is going to draw the attention of uh, Elijah Muhammad and he is going to be suspended from the Nation of Islam. Um, he, after this, is going to make a pilgrimage to Mecca um, and he's going to notice that there really, really wasn't a lot of racial discord among the Orthodox Muslims and he just kind of says, like, why? Why is uh, why can't we have this um, everywhere? Why does there have to be this racial discord uh, in the United States to the degree that it is right now? Uh, so he's going to advocate continuously for black identity and uh, uh, ending racism. Uh, and... What we're going to see is he really draws the attention of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the SNCC, um, and he'll continue to be a uh, leader in the movement. He did believe that the enemy was racism, not the white race. Um, it, this hatred, this discrimination, that is the true enemy. It's not um, the entirety of the white population. It just so happened to be that there was a significant portion of the white population that held the ideas of racism, and those two kind of bled together. Uh, he will continue to push for the organization of Afro-American unity. He will become the leadership in uh, that regard. Um, and in February of 1965 in New York City, uh, he is going to be assassinated by a rival black Muslim group uh, while he was addressing his organization, which was titled the Organization of African American Unity, uh, in a ballroom in Washington Heights.
And again, this is going to have a significant impact on the people because he was such a larger than life figure, not just for the civil rights movement, but for the country at this time. To add on to that, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. is going to be assassinated in 1968. Um, it's really kind of eerie to look back on some of the speeches of Martin Luther King Jr. because in one of his speeches, he kind of foreshadows that he's not going to live very long, or at least he won't see the end of the civil rights movement. In his speech, he says, I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And now we look back on that and think, wow, uh, that's really powerful. Um, he had already as survived an assassination attempt when he uh, made that speech. Um, it, it was at a department store in uh, 1958. Um, and when that assassination attempt happens, it only reaffirmed that he wanted to continue down this path of nonviolence. Now, King is going to work on many different avenues of the civil rights movement and one of those is going to be to aid the working poor. Now he is going to work with both black and white working poor in order to kind of push for unionization, to push for better working conditions, to push for better pay. Uh, and what he was doing in Memphis is he was going to speak at the Memphis Tennessee sanitation workers strike. So this was just one of the many facets that he was uh, associated with within the civil rights movement. Uh, and what is going to happen is that King was going to be standing on the second floor balcony of a motel in Memphis uh, where they were staying and a sniper is going to shoot him. Uh, he was rushed to the hospital, but he was pronounced dead. Uh, and he was only 39 years old. And it really does shake the nation. Uh, once news of his death is is made public, uh, there are going to be riots across the country in many of the major cities, and some of them do turn violent, where there we'll see burning and looting. And in this wave of national mourning, we have Lyndon B. Johnson, who is president at the time, and he's going to have to urge Americans to think back to who it was that was assassinated and reject this violence and say that, you know, King was the apostle of nonviolence is what Johnson refers to him as. And this isn't the way that he would want um, anybody reacting, no matter what the situation was. Um, the mourning of King is going to be felt across color lines throughout the, the United States. Um, but it did widen this rift that was the civil rights movement. Many people are going to see King's assassination as a rejection of the pursuit of equality. Uh, some people are going to say that his nonviolence um, is not the way to go any further. Um, it, and you put the murder of Malcolm X plus... Martin Luther King Jr. just three years later, it's really going to fuel the movements of the Black Power Movement and the Black Panther Party. And it, it's, it's going to push the civil rights movement forward in, in a different way. Um, and the campaign for establishing a national holiday in his honor had started immediately after he was assassinated, um, but there were many proponents that said that, no, this shouldn't happen. There was even um, critics who used FBI surveillance that uh, to paint King as an adulterer and say that he was influenced by communists to kind of sabotage having this national holiday. Uh, Ronald Reagan is going to sign the King holiday bill into law in 1983, uh, so almost 20 years later. Uh, it takes a while to get this national holiday in the books. The final assassination that we need to look at uh, during this time period 
is uh, Robert F. Kennedy in 1968. When John F. Kennedy is elected president in 1960, he is going to name his brother as attorney general. As attorney general, Kennedy is going to continue to battle against corruption and labor unions, going against the mobsters, the organized crime. He's even going to convict Jimmy Hoffa in 1964. He's also going to support the civil rights movement. He's going to be uh, a, a, a pivotal person in that movement. Um He's going to send troops to Mississippi to enforce Supreme Court orders such as what we saw in Mississippi with James Meredith pushing uh, the federal troops to protect him to be able to attend the University of Mississippi. Um, he, he really was a, a figure of the Democratic Party. He was attorney general. He then became uh, a senator in New York. Um, he was going to run for the next president. Uh, and given his background working with not only Lyndon B. Johnson and passing the Civil Rights Act, but with his brother uh, Kennedy throughout the Cuban Missile Crisis and other foreign affairs, uh, he really was the person that we thought was going to unite the country after Lyndon B. Johnson. And I know we're getting ahead of ourselves because I haven't even talked about Johnson yet, but... During Johnson's presidency, not only just the civil rights movement, but Vietnam is going to take uh, and split the nation, and we'll get into it. But it at this time, when Kennedy was setting up to run for the Democrat, the Democratic presidential primary, people thought he not only would he win, but he would unite the country because of his stance and just the work that he had done. This is truly the what if of these, uh, not that all of them aren't, but this is one of those moments where had he been able to live and go on to potentially be president, I wonder what the pathway of the United States would have looked like. Uh, he is actually going to uh, be killed uh, while he's out beginning his campaign, he was actually with a couple of athletes at the time. Uh, they were exiting um, one of the hotels, and a man named Sirhan Sirhan is going to uh, approach him with a gun that was hidden in a rolled-up campaign poster. Uh, he was about a foot away when he shot Kennedy. Um, it... It was incredibly sad. Um, Sirhan was born in Palestine, and he is going to confess to the crime. He will receive the death sentence, but California had uh, uh, rejected the death penalty, so that invalidated his death sentence. Um, but he will spend the rest of his life in prison. Um, and he says that he killed him... Uh, because Kennedy was instrumental in the oppression of Palestinians. Um, it, it just, when we see this, it really, not only was it at the height of the Vietnam War, but we're a country that was kind of broken. Um, and without this kind of leadership, it, it took us in a different direction. Um, Hubert Humphrey is going to actually end up running for the Democratic Party in 1968. He loses to Richard Nixon, um, and that's the trajectory that we went on. But I just want to give a full picture of what we've got here. So we talked about Medgar Evers, John F. Kennedy, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., and Robert F. Kennedy. And what all of these people have in common is that our country really looked to them during this time where we had many um, fractures in our society and these people were leading us to attempt to get rid of that hatred, to get rid of that division, to unite us in whatever way possible, in whatever their beliefs were. And their assassinations really do uh, cause uh, the, the nation to reflect on what, where we were at and what we were doing. Not that we changed once they were assassinated, uh, but it really did have an impact on how people were feeling. 
We are going to work uh, a little bit here with Johnson. Uh, I want to kind of give you a whole picture before we get into um, Vietnam. We have a couple more pieces to get through. Um, we're going to cover a lot of the societal part of Johnson's presidency before we get into the foreign affairs Vietnam of it all. So to start, um, Johnson is going to win the election in 1964. Remember, Kennedy was assassinated when he was going to start his campaign for the 1964 election. So Johnson will finish out that last year and will campaign. He will win in 1964. He gets about 60% of the popular vote against a, a, a man named Barry Goldwater, who was running for the Republican Party. Um, and when... Johnson comes into the presidency being voted in. He is going to declare what was called a war on poverty. Remember, Johnson is a Democrat. Uh, I know he's a Texas Democrat, and uh, it brings a very different kind of perspective. Kennedy added him to the ticket uh, when he ran for the president because he was a Texas Democrat. So remember, we have the South that's really splitting from the Democratic Party who was pushing for the civil rights movement. Um, and Johnson was meant to win portions of the South for Kennedy. I know that sounds wild that we have the South being more Democratic than not, but remember, we're still kind of roots from the Civil War, Southern Democrats. So Johnson was able to win that portion for Kennedy originally, and that sets him up for the election of 1964. So when he comes into the presidency, there are about 40 million Americans living below the poverty line, which causes Johnson to say, we as a nation need to declare a war on poverty. Believe me, it is not going to be lost on you or me that he uses the word war here because at this time, and I know we've been kind of skirting around it, America is at war uh, in the sense that we are in a cold war with the Soviet Union, and in a sense that we are in a hot conflict in Vietnam, very much in it. Uh, so when he uses this language of war on poverty, it's purposeful. What Johnson is going to believe is that with a budget deficit from the federal government, we can improve the economy. On the surface, this sounds like a great idea. Budget deficit. Okay, that means that you don't spend all of the budget. Oh, that sounds like it would improve the economy. But how do you spend what you need to spend to run a country but not spend all of it? That's an interesting proposition. And the way he wanted to go about this was to uh, support tax cuts, um, to cut government spending. So you're cutting how much money is coming in and you're also cutting how much money is going out. Um he was successful. Uh, the, de the deficit is going to decline. Unemployment fell. Uh, we, uh, we see um, what he wanted to have happened. And I feel like if the Vietnam War hadn't kind of turned the federal budget on its head, maybe we could have seen more success in the direction that Johnson wanted to go for the economy. Um, he is going to pass the... Uh, Economic Opportunity Act, and this was an attempt to attack the causes of, proper, uh, of poverty. Um, when we look at the causes of po poverty, um, illiteracy and, an un and unemployment are going to be the two big ones. So what the Economic Opportunity Act is going to do is put about $950 million into a few separate uh, projects. One of those projects is going to be uh, work training programs. Um, the other big program that you have probably heard of is called Head Start. The goal of Head Start was to empower parents and make sure every child had a shot at success. Uh, so think about what Head Start does. Head Start um, is kind of a babysitting service provided by the government so that parents can go and work, right? Think about what is the most expensive for parents of young children. It's daycare. And a lot of parents will say, I'll stay home 
one can work so that we cut the cost of daycare because it just is that expensive. The government started recognizing that and put money into the Head Start program. Uh, and at Head Start, they also tackled that illiteracy uh, program as well, uh, or that illiteracy rate as well, because Head Start isn't just babysitting. Head Start is working with children um, on education and the like. Um, this money also went to funding preschool programs, supporting school libraries, purchasing textbooks, providing special education services. So Head Start is a, a very all-encompassing program that really set out to get parents to be able to be able to go to work uh, without suffering the cost uh, or at least the full brunt cost of daycare and um, starting an early education for students. The last one that we see there is VISTA, uh, Volunteers in Service to America. I want you to kind of put a star next to this one because we don't talk about this too much, but uh, Kennedy had started the Peace Corps program. And if you know anything about the Peace Corps, the Peace Corps goes around the world and works on poverty in different countries in different areas throughout the world and the goal of the peace corps focus on that word peace was to provide peace by making the people not suffer as much in in poverty so building schools helping with clean water helping with energy things that we see today but kennedy's kind of uh twist on this was to promote peace with the asterisk of avoid communism, right? Because people who are peaceful, people who are not suffering, uh, people who have help don't turn to the communists for help. I say all of this to explain VISTA because VISTA is the Peace Corps for places in the United States. Uh, what we did was send volunteers into poverty-stricken communities in America to solve pressing economic, educational, medical problems, these kinds of issues. So we're sending people into poor communities for aid. Um, it served people in inner city schools, rural health clinics, urban hospitals. So sending people where our home community needed it the most, where Kennedy did it around the world, Vista does it here at home. All right, healthcare. This will probably be where we stop today because it's going to take me a hot minute to explain the changes to healthcare under Johnson, and then we'll do uh, the last two slides of this tomorrow. Uh, when Johnson takes office, remember we're still this war on poverty, right? Uh, there are two groups of Americans that are massively uninsured. That is going to be the elderly and the poor. Now, are you ready for some life lesson moment? Without insurance, you are in danger, okay? I know that sometimes when we are young and uh, we, we don't really think about insurance and the fact that going to the doctor is very expensive or when you get hurt, all of the things are very expensive. But as you get older... Or if you are in a situation where staying healthy is not easy, um, it, medical costs can bury you. Just think about if you have uh, the, the flu or the stomach bug. You want to go to the doctor. That doctor visit costs money. Your insurance covers some of the cost of going to the doctor so that you don't pay for everything out of pocket. Because when you go to the doctor... Everything costs money from the time that you walk in the door, every test that they do, the time with the doctor, all of that stuff starts to add up. And without insurance, you pay for that all out of pocket. Now, bringing this back to Johnson, when you look at those two groups during his time in office that were uninsured, the elderly and the poor, those are the two groups that we see most often going to the doctor. Think about how often old people go to the doctor or how many medications they take or how easy it is for them to get sick. Imagine that with no insurance. 
and the poor as well. Uh, typically, people who were poor at this time, they didn't have the best living conditions. So they were very vulnerable to illnesses or they may be working in pretty harsh conditions. Now they're not going to be as harsh as the ones we looked at in the early 1800s, but it's still not great. Uh, so again, a very vulnerable part of the population. And if these groups get sick, they don't necessarily have the means to pay to put that to get back on their feet. Kennedy had started this idea of health care for these groups in his presidential campaign in 1960. He just couldn't get Congress to approve his proposed plans. But when Johnson becomes president, the Democrats are going to take control of Congress in 1964. And now this is back on the table. I don't mean to give Kennedy all the credit, but he, he does put together the plan. But this is something that Truman, uh, it, it came up during his fair deal. Um, he, we've had this kind of idea of government health insurance, medical ass assistance over time. It just hadn't really come to fruition the way it does under Kennedy and Johnson. There are two pieces that are a part of this law or that are put into law by Johnson. The first is Medicare and the second is Medicaid. I wish they would have named them different things so that it was easier to remember them. But Medicare is hospital and low cost insurance for those over the age of 65. Why the age of 65? This was kind of the retirement age. It still very much is the retirement age. Um, and when you retire, usually your insurance is tied to who you are employed by. So we wanted to provide insurance to those who are retiring. And we want to make sure that people aren't hanging on to their job just for their insurance. So this takes care of a few pieces here. Kind of piggybacks off of Social Security, which was also an incentive for people to retire or just a safety net for people to retire. But Social Security didn't cover uh, insurance, so now Medicare does. Medicaid goes after helping the other group of people that were vulnerable at the time. This is low cost coverage to poor Americans of any age. Okay, so now you have 65 and over, but you also have insurance available to those that meet a certain uh, income threshold. Okay, and this doesn't have an age tied to it. That way we could take care of the other part of the program. These two programs are the most important social welfare legislation since Social Security in 1935. If you take anything away from Johnson's presidency, it has to be that he declared a war on poverty and that he provided health care to the elderly in the poor. Okay. Now in your time, you've heard the changes uh, that came with Obamacare because the health insurance industry is wild. We could spend a ton of time talking about how insurance is at the end of the day, it is a business. I know that we think of it as a helpful tool because it does aid in, in getting health care and things like that. But when you get into the fine details, insurance companies used to reject people because of pre-existing conditions. Uh, they used to look at people and say, you're going to cost us a little bit too much money. Therefore, we won't provide you coverage. And that is also wild uh, because... Who needs insurance the most? It's probably those people with the pre-existing conditions. They're going to need uh, coverage for medication and things like that. We are nowhere near perfect where we've come from uh, uh, here to there to all over the place. But we do have some uh, current connections that we can get to with this, um, with Obamacare, and I'll, I'll kind of draw us uh, in our attention back to that tomorrow with some current news uh, with that. 
uh, to give you uh, a better picture of Medicare and Medicaid, uh, I want you to take a look here. So Medicare is for over the age of 65. Uh, once you're over the age of 65, um, you can qualify for coverage. Uh, certain people with disabilities and people with end of stage uh, diseases can be covered uh, under Medicare as well. Uh, Medicare is federally administered, so that comes from the federal government, health insurance from the federal government. Uh, and Medicare is paid uh, through trust funds, uh, which are mainly paid through taxes, specifically payroll taxes, um, and through Social Security benefits. So Medicare very much works with uh, Social Security. And then you have Medicaid that covers low income, uh, adults, children, any age. Uh, it also covers people who are blind, disabled, uh, and they are eligible for assistance. Medicaid is funded by both the federal and state government. So it is a government program, but it's split uh, cost-wise uh, between the federal and the state. Uh, they both control uh, and administer. So from state to state, your Medicaid uh, eligibility might be a little bit different. Uh, how you qualify um, and how you apply may be a little different, um, but it is joint by state and federal. Okay, tomorrow we will pick back up and finish up uh, the Great Society and we'll start the Warren Court. You have a few minutes here. Make sure that you're working on your assignments that are due tomorrow. Uh, and if you have any questions, please let me know.